Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join our webinar on uh, the security posture of the ASX 200. Of course, based on the ASX 200 um, cyber research report that uh, we publish every year here at UpGuard, uh, and it always generates um, a lot of, you know, a lot of curiosity and a lot of feedback. So we decided we'd uh, set up this webinar to run through some of the major points. And got a couple of speakers today. We've got myself. Uh, I'm Josh Kiff. I'm the VP of Sales uh, for APAC here at UpGuard. Uh, I've been with the company almost 18 months now, and through my time and talking to a lot of customers, I've noticed a lot of, you know, a big shift, and it's particularly in the last 12 months um, for many organizations in terms of their cyber processes um, and the needing to improve them, and also their requirements for visibility over their um, cyber attack surfaces. So, you know, Really, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are, you know, agreeing with that uh, that are on today. And also joined by Greg Pollock, our VP of Cyber Research and the author of our ASX 200 report. And look, Greg is an experienced product manager and cybersecurity researcher whose insights, you know, they've been featured in publications like Forbes and CNN, Washington Post and Bloomberg. The, the list goes on, but uh, welcome to you, Greg. Yeah, thanks, Josh. It's it's great to be here. I just realized there's like weird light shining on my face. It's it's um getting towards sunset here, but um yeah, I, my face looks normal. It's just the light that's weird. Don't worry. I, I should probably apologize for my uh, for my COVID haircut that my wife gave me, and uh, I'm sure there's a few people with similar um, tragic haircuts as well. So the agenda for today is uh, talk about data leaks versus data breaches, um, what they are, and um, I'll have Greg explain those one through the ASX 200 security findings. We'll also talk about what you and your organizations can do to prevent data leaks. And finally, how UpGuard can help you um, increase your cybersecurity posture. So I'm sure that no one here will be, um, you know, will disagree with us when we say that cyber threats are increasing and they're multiplying. Um, and there's a variety of reasons for that, correct, Greg? Uh, digitalization of uh, of companies and their assets, cloud adoption, and you know, COVID as well, correct? Yeah, I mean, there are all these trends that have been going on for for, for decades and sort of growing at a, an exponential rate, um, and you know, they've been only accentuated by yeah, COVID is a worldwide event that affects everyone, and remote work. If you can be remote working, then you're remote working. And that requires a, a lot of additional you know, technological tools to make that happen. Um, I want to, to, I don't want to promote the next webinar we have coming up, but there's a, there's another case that our team recently worked on that really shows this. Um, we recently discovered a set of misconfigurations in Microsoft Power Apps portals, where um, a disproportionate number of these portals that were leaking sensitive data were COVID vaccination um, websites or websites to register for COVID vaccinations. Um, in the U.S. and they were all over the U.S. Now all of those were only set up at the you know the beginning months of 2021. There was no COVID vaccination um, <laughs> program before that, and and so that kind of um, yeah that is just that's a whole massive set of data for millions of people you know medical related data for millions of people that would not have been you know put on the internet were it not for the way in which COVID has precipitated things like mass vaccination programs. And that's just one example of how COVID has has you know forced us to move a lot of information online, um, as well as, of course, like us doing this webinar this way, you know, the, the whole way that, we, that everyone works now. A hundred percent. It it was heading that way anyway, but COVID's just, uh, you know, sped that process up, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I would say. Yeah. Excellent. Well, look, one of the one of the major points that is brought up through the report, Greg, and you know, is around data leaks. And uh, we thought we'd we'd get you to explain the difference between a data leak and a data breach. Was going to be the other thing he was going to say. Um, we're just we read each other's minds like that. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is this distinction is foundational to you know what our team's research does, and then also the kind of risk that we're talking about in this report, because um, it's two very different threat models. A, a data breach is a malicious actor trying to break into your systems um, and, you know, usually for some sort of criminal profit motive, um, usually to exfiltrate data, um, yeah, for personal enrichment. A data leak is, is a totally different threat model where people who are probably supposed to be handling data 
um, mishandle it, you, you know, usually accidentally. It's not malicious, um, but data that they're supposed to be keeping private in some way, they've misconfigured some system that they're storing it in, maybe because they don't understand it, they're just in a rush, it's human error, and have made that sensitive data um, public. And I think that's, that's important, um, not just understanding what we're talking about here are these data leaks we're talking about, um, data that we found that was publicly accessible, um, as opposed to talking about data that we learned was stolen. But I think it's also really important, and I think I'll come back to this probably, is um, to understand that um, the we have pretty good telemetry and systems and understanding about data breaches. Uh, for basically as long as we've had internet and, and digital business, we've been trying to stop data breaches. Data leaks are a problem where um, there's not as much preparedness and I think there's a lot of latent risk here. And, and one of the ways we've seen this, again, not to get too far afield, but um, in comparing data that we see leaked to data that we know has been breached, there's not a lot of overlap. The way data breaches happen is often quite different. And the, micro, the Microsoft Power Apps portals case showed this as well. We found um, dozens of these portals leaking sensitive data, and it was not the data we were seeing being distributed on the dark web. So there's all this data just hanging out there through leaks that's not yet being exploited. I don't think that will last forever. So now I think is a good time to to start measuring this and getting ahead of the problem before it becomes you know, uh, much more serious. Oh, hundred uh, percent. And it is something that as we deal with, or as we talk to, you know, customers of ours or potential customers of ours, it's one of the big things that they're starting to bring up. They, they want to understand how we address data leaks and, you know, and understand their risk and, and how they can mitigate it as well. And I guess that probably leads very well to the next question, Greg, which is, how are data leaks discovered? Or, or more importantly, how do we at UpGuard discover um, data leaks? And you know, how do we turn them into, you can see their verified findings? Yeah, right. I mean, so with what I just said, with sort of an understanding of what a leak is, is you know, of course, and what it's not, then mm -hmm. that informs you know, the design of our system and our, our processes to, to discover and then verify them. So these, these data leaks that we're talking about are, um, you know, it's, it's data of some sensitivity that's been made publicly accessible on the internet. Um, and there's, you know, kind of a, uh, a nice, you know, curve graph of um, how these happen with there's sort of some places where um, data leaks are very, very often happen um, and very large ones will happen. And then there's sort of like a long tail of uh, less frequently, um, you know, sources where data is less frequently leaked. And this, this um, slide, then we've listed some of the ones that I think the well-known ones. Um, we're far from the only people to ever talk about data leaks happening on GitHub where developer credentials are often um, posted, as well as sometimes, you know, like old backups of, of databases and so forth. Um, databases themselves, like Elasticsearch and MongoDB, the way those systems are designed and sold, um, put them at a higher risk of allowing anonymous access um, when connected to the internet. Uh, Amazon S3, again, uh, Again, for the Power App story, then I talked to a lot of journalists, and I would say, "Hey, uh, do, do you know about Amazon S3 data leaks?" And they'd say, "Oh, yes, yes, I've known about that for a few years." So that's a another case where it's a technology; it's easy to misconfigure. And so we've developed um, search technologies specific to each of these sources. So if you want to find databases leaking data, then you canvas um, you know the IPv4 range, and you look for those ports and those services, and then you, we would. Um, download samples of data to establish you know, um, who it belongs to, what kinds of data are in it. GitHub, again, there are like ways to access those data. Um, and then, yeah, so we find these things through software and then people need to look at them because um, it's a, a serious thing to report a data leak. And we need to be sure of the scope, who's impacted, who we should notify, all that kind of stuff. And ultimately that leads to the verified findings where we can usually report them to our customers or in this case, include them in the report. Um so look, one of the big headlines, Greg, that came out uh, of the report that, that you worked on was the, uh, the percentage, which is over a third of companies in the report had a data leak in 2021. So wanted to, to hear your thoughts on that and the type of you know, data leaks that, uh, that they were experiencing. Yeah, right. I mean, it's, um, it's a significant proportion of these companies. Um, <clears throat> And it's actually the problem is is much worse than this presented as. You know, I I, I, don't, I like to you know under promise and over deliver. In this case, we used a very conservative methodology um, for you know considering what is a leak and what companies are in scope for this search. And this is also you know um, work we were doing just as sort of a, a one-off for this recurring study we do. 
and we were using just one keyword to do these searches and attribute them to the companies for our customers or for, for others, others, then we um, do a lot more in-depth research. So for example, um, when companies do trials with us, then we'll do a, you know, a, an analyst supervised data leak search. And in those, then about 48% of companies have a confirmed data leak. Um, and, and again, that's sort of a point in time, you know, time box amount of research being done for those, those companies. And for our customers for whom we're doing continuous searches, then it's, uh, yeah, like much higher. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, this, this number shows that this is it's a, a significantly widespread problem. Um, if it were a tiny proportion of these companies, I don't think we'd be here talking about it. We'd be, you know, either wrong about this being a problem or just way ahead of our time. But I think the next um, slide sort of looking at this over time um, gives us a sense of you know, the trajectory that we're headed on here. Yeah, hundred percent. It was something that that I was amazed at because you know we are maturing a lot of our a lot of the organisations in regards to their you know cybersecurity awareness, but uh, it's continuing to jump twenty nine percent to to thirty six. That's you know over a seven percent jump in uh, in those three years. Um, it's not going anywhere, and it's going to affect everyone, whether it's yourself or through your third parties. Um, you know, over the short to medium term, I would say, Greg, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I, I expect this number to go to 100. I don't, I don't think this is the thing where, I mean, it's like, it's like having vulnerabilities in your mm -hmm. websites. You're only having more websites and there are only more technology spread across them and there are more vulnerabilities being discovered. It's, it's a, with vulnerabilities, then we're in a state where it's about prioritization, um, getting context. Vulnerability management is not about keeping at like inbox zero of vulnerabilities. It's about addressing mm -hmm. the ones that are most important. I think we are very much headed that direction with data leaks as well, because the, the underlying causes here are, um, do you have a lot of employees? Do you have a lot of computer systems? Do your, handle, do your, do your employees handle digital um, information? Those are things where yes, like all, like everyone's going to be handling digital information. Um, and yeah, it's, so I think we're, we're headed towards a future where this number keeps growing. Now that's not a, you know, it's not, we're not, we're not like on a doomsday countdown towards when everyone has data lakes, the game's over. It just means that the way in which we respond to these problems will get, will get better as well. A hundred percent. I completely agree with you. And look, one of the things that really I found interesting um, through the report was when you break uh, the ASX 200 up into quartiles. So if you look at the most valuable quartile, you could call that the ASX 50. Um, interestingly, between 20 and 21, 2021, the, uh, you know, the likelihood or the number of data leaks actually decreased slightly compared to the other quartiles and the least valuable quartile, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Greg, but I think it jumped from 6% to 17% um, in that 12 months, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I see the, the difference in the, the um, quartile, uh, the, the ASX 50. I think that difference is, is noise. I wouldn't read into that as compared to the overall trend where, okay, like we just said, we're seeing year over year increase. What kinds of, where is that increase happening? Mm. Um, does it mean that the, the companies that were having, the kinds of companies that were having leaks before, like, like way more of them, you know, would we be looking at 80% of the ASX 50 having leaks? No, no. what we're seeing is that it's becoming, um, I was going to say um, more democratized. That's not the right word. It's one <laughs> that, um, it happens to businesses with more different kinds of features. So it used to be more or less that the bigger you are, the more people, you know, the bigger your, your, your internet footprint, these things all correlate. Those mm -hmm. are the things that cause data leaks. Now I think there's some decoupling between the market cap of the company and their digital complexity, um, such that smaller companies can be of sufficient digital complexity um, to also have the problem of, of data leaks. And I think that's, that's, that's really interesting. That was one thing I, I did not know how this trend would go, could have gone a number of ways. But yeah, it's really yeah. interesting to see that companies mean like that um, the, the, the smallest by, smallest quartile by market cap, it, it was almost like a non-issue before. Um, and now it's, you know, yeah, going on 20%. It's a very, it's a very real issue um, for that, that group. Yeah, no, I, I think it speaks to companies that are in this list, but also companies that aren't or, I yeah, guess hope to be true. in this list, right? It, it, it's happening across the board. Yeah, it becomes much harder to predict. I mean, when, mm. yeah, it, it used to be that, yeah, you would tend to see it for very large companies um, and then generally not for smaller companies because 
it's easier to enforce, you know, the various controls you would have. And we'll talk about that at the end of the, the session. There are various controls like, you know, um, just how you develop software, how you manage systems, how you educate employees. These kinds of things can reduce data leaks. Um, but yeah, we're seeing it be far harder to predict based on other factors. You know, a small company could still have critical leaks or a medium company, or they could be, you know, um, have, have no issues at all. It's becoming, yes, much, much harder to sort of um, make assumptions about who will and won't have this based on um, other information other than, you know, just doing a data leak search itself. One of the other interesting parts, and maybe, you know, it's, it's not that interesting or, or that, you know, unexpected is when you break the list down by, by industry and, you know, it, it correlates, doesn't it? The, the companies that have more IT infrastructure are the ones that are, that are getting a larger number of, um, of data leaks, correct? Yeah, I mean, really, it's the com it's the companies that are, are really developing a lot of um, new systems. It's, it's mm. sort of when things are moving that these problems are most likely to happen. When you're adopting new stuff, um, part of the reason being, um, and, and there's a corollary to this I'll get to, you're adopting new stuff, you have to figure out how it works. Um, you know, your, your, your focus is always on making it work. Um, and you may be under budget constraints that make it so that there's some part of it, you know, you're, you're checking in code late at night. Um, we very, very often see, you know, just mistakes where someone is clearly trying to commit to their works GitHub repo, mm. and instead, um, I don't know, they're working on their, their stock analysis project, and they committed to their personal repo instead, um, and now all of your source code is out on the internet. Um, it's th those kinds of um, yeah, digital transformation projects, when people are moving fast, that they wind up breaking things. And in some ways, the, the flip side of that is that companies that are not innovating or not adopting new technology are, are going to be at high, are, are the companies that are at higher risks of those data breaches we were talking about. So you'll see here, healthcare is relatively low on this. Well, we know that um, you know, small hospitals are, are, are very much at risk for ransomware and other attacks. And they're likely to be running a fairly static set of IT systems. I guess, yeah, in this case, these are, these are the ASX companies, not, not um, the small hospitals, but mm. Um, th there's the corollary of companies that are not changing, running static um, systems are at risk of a different set of problems that would be reflected in the, the data breaches that we're more likely to see. It's just simply a different way it happens. And yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a balancing act to, to move fast enough to stay ahead of those. Um, and then also to stay competitive in the marketplace without um, you know, slipping into to the problem of data leaks. 100%. I think you've just got to be prepared and, and be able to mitigate whether it is a data leak or a data breach or, you know, a vulnerability, whatever it is. <laughs> um, but I, I guess that leads to what can you do um, to, you know, uh, be more resilient. And, you know, th there are a number of things. We, we've listed a few of them here. Um, the first one is cybersecurity and education awareness for your employees. Really easy one. We have a, we have a part of our platform called Identity Breaches, where you can look at apps that um, that you know have been breached or you know data has been exposed, and you've got staff that are using you know their own work credentials and their own generic passwords. Doesn't take a genius to figure out how to break into a you know someone's system using that. That that's an example, an easy example. Getting awareness up for your employees and making sure they're doing the right things and changing their passwords you know regularly. Um, continuous security monitoring it, it leads to security improvements. So making sure that you're continuously um, looking at yourself and your, and your third parties as well. Um, you know, you can have a look at a point in time. I think, Greg, you mentioned um, at the top, uh, you, you know, you can have a look at a point in time, but it's, you know, we work in a 24-7 world and, you know, people are, are online 24-7. You need to be looking and having alerts letting you know when these, uh, these, these changes happen. Um, the third one there, you know, um, have a good threat intelligence and data leak program and, um, and searching those for your organization. And finally, monitoring your vendor security and data leaks as well. It's, it's an important aspect, isn't it, Greg? Because it's, it's sort of out of your remit. You can't control what's happening with, uh, with your third parties, can you? Right. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I'm the, like the, again, to go back to the power apps portals thing, I, I spent three months working on it and like, it's, I think it's a, a well-known issue now. Yeah. That's a case where there's this issue, there's a configuration issue that many, many people got wrong, but it is part of the documentation. So if you, the way you did the project was you sat down and read all the documentation and then sort of flagged potential security concerns. 
um, it's more likely you would have you know kept this in your mind as something you need to get right. Hmm. I think, but you don't have to do that to be able to use the product. It's a it's a Microsoft product. It's very easy to come in, make something in the UI, um, and it works. Um, but I think it's important to, yeah. And actually, I mean, for people in this webinar, I think you can use this report to say to make the case for why you need to, um, why your your company needs to budget time for you know security preparedness not just like fishing stuff, but for like for projects. Hey, we need, to, we need to budget time to read the doco. If we don't do that, then there are very real consequences to it. And, and everyone needs to have time to do that because if anyone doesn't understand these systems, they can be the one who leaks all the code. Um, that said, um, those kinds of controls that you can advocate for internally are ones that are become harder to do outside of your organization. Um, and yeah, it's just the fact that uh, part of what's so awesome about computers, it's very easy to exchange information. Um, having this very fast, very cheaply, um, you know, no material impact. And so it's very easy for your, your vendors to have lots of data for you. Um, and, and knowing their controls, I mean, there are of course like ways, there are vendor management programs, you can ask them about it, you can get attestations from them, really a good thing to do. But um, yeah, there's still, you wanna have the backstop of knowing whether they are, are living up to those because they most likely may not know if they're leaking data. 100%. So always good to have, you know, uh, all your bases covered, as it were.